but they don't listen. I mean, there's, there's, your, your question is a, is a perfectly good question, but it's not, it's not really relevant because what they do is simply stick their fingers in their ear and say, la, la, la. They know what's true because it's in the holy book. And that, that even, I mean, the most extreme case is the geologist Kurt Wise, who has a PhD in geology from Harvard and said, if all the evidence in the universe pointed towards an old earth, I would be the first to admit it, but I would still be a young earth creationist because that is what Holy Scripture teaches me. You cannot argue with, 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 a, with, a, with a mind like that. A mind like that, it seems to me, is, well, a disgrace to the human species. <laughs> um, you suggested that uh, Mormons are... Um, uh, the the, the toss-up is whether... Yes. Um, I mean, the, the Mormon religion is so obviously fake founded by a transparent charlatan in the 19th century, Joseph Smith. I mean, nothing could be more obvious than that that man was a fake and a charlatan and a liar. And yet now, we have a presidential candidate who is prepared to say that he believes in this mountebank, who wrote a bogus book, the Book of Mormon, although he was writing in the 19th century, chose to write it in 17th century English. I mean, why don't people see through that? I just can't understand it. Um, but anyway, um, that was a digression, right? There may well be a profound need to understand, and the satisfaction that you get from genuine understanding, which comes from science, is so much, so much greater. I mean, there is far more beauty in the real understanding of the reality of nature than there is in reading some ancient book or than reading some modern book, which is what the Book of Mormon is, and I have to say that when I read the Book of Mormon recently, I didn't read it all, what impressed me was that it's an obvious fake. I mean, this is a 19th century book written in 16th century English, and it came to pass, verily I say unto you, and things like that. That's not the way people talked in the 19th century. It's a fake. So it's not beautiful, it's a work of charlatanry. As, uh, oh, do I, uh, uh, you have, uh, you, you, you're free to answer. The book's been studied and, and, and torn apart and, and looked at, and I am not, I, I'm not one of the, one of the professors of that, course, is, that, have, that have done it. Yeah. But do you, do you believe If you were to call this man a charlatan, it, I do, I do, I take offense to it. And he was a convicted charlatan. No, he was a convicted no, con man. No, th these are all falses. You should do your, do your research. Well, and, I, yeah. I think I have. Well, yeah, you have. But, um, the Bible and the Quran are both genuinely ancient books, um, so they're not obvious fakes in the, in the way the Book of Mormon is. And they do contain uh, great poetry, uh, and these are ancient myths which are of great interest to mythologists, to anthropologists, great mythologists, to anthropologists. They're not actually more interesting than the myths you get from other parts of the world which are also very interesting. You can get consolation from all sorts of falsehoods, but because it's consoling, it doesn't mean it's true. No, but do you think that's wrong? No, I don't think it's wrong, but I think what matters is what's true. And I, I don't care what's consoling, I care about what's true. Be I am regularly moved by poetry, by music, by beautiful s sunset. That's not unexplainable. In principle, it's unexplainable in practice, I can't actually give you a scientific explanation for why the sound of a Schubert string quintet or, uh, the, um, or, a, or a Hausmann poem moves me to tears, but I believe that there is an explanation which is ultimately to be found in the natural world. It's not convenient in the short term to attempt to explain it in scientific terms. It's better to explain it in artistic terms. I, I think it's very sad since there's such a lot that we can prove and, and it's so, so rich, especially nowadays. I mean, back in the Middle Ages, there was virtually nothing and so it was natural to turn to religion. But what about, uh, for example, astrology or uh, alternative medicine? Astrology is rubbish, um, uh, obviously. Um, Not all people say that. I didn't say so in my style. <laughs> Alter alternative medicine, um, much of it, uh, it, it, it may not be rubbish, but if it's not rubbish, then it will cease to be alternative. It will be adopted 
um, by, by, by medicine. So if somebody demonstrates that acupuncture works, then any good doctor would immediately adopt it as part of medicine. Well, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's culture. It's, it's politeness, too. It's, it's, it's courtesy. Um, if, you're, if you're in a situation, if, I, if I'm in, a, um, say, a Hindu temple, I take my shoes off and treat it with respect because I don't want to disrespect the people there. Do you think one should have a, one should have a Santa Claus for the um, children? Well, when Explain my own... Explain that one. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, one. Did you ever have Santa Claus? Or did, yes. Did you, um, did you dress up like Santa Claus? No. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I was asked by a small child, I didn't say, there is no Santa Claus. I said, well, let's just work it out. How many chimneys are there in the world? How long would it take to get from each chimney to the next? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I've been subjected to a kind of word salad of scientific jargon used out of context with in inappropriately, apparently uncomprehendingly. So, Dr. Dawkins, I would like to remind you that ad hominem is a logical fallacy, and that's science 101. You should know that. Ad hominem means talking I, about. This is my as an turn individual. to speak, sir. Okay? You accused me of jargon. You accused me of misusing language. How many people understood what I was saying? You're lying. <laughs> okay. Basically, the atomic universe is stardust, and stardust has sentience in you and me. It's according to people like Freeman Dyson, even atoms have sentience. Atoms have no sentience. Atoms... You disagree with Freeman Dyson? Yeah, then? If, if that's what he says, which I doubt, I disagree with him. <laughs> At atoms do not have sentience. Atoms contribute to making brains Brains have sentience. Have and you seriously one. just said that a single cell has consciousness? A single cell has awareness. What do you mean by that? That it has the ability to respond to its environment. Of course it has the ability to respond to its environment. That is so, not consciousness. Uh, so you said a while ago, atoms get together to create complexity. How do they get together? By processes which are well understood by, by a biologists. process which is random <laughs> or intelligent? Not intelligence. Okay. By the processes of embryology put together by the processes of evolution. You cannot seriously sit there and say that the hard problem of consciousness, and it is a very hard problem, is solved by saying that a single cell has consciousness. Uh, cognition, perception, uh, imagination, insight, intuition, creativity, choice, freedom, the desire for meaning, purpose, all of that are expressions of awareness as consciousness and influence everything that we experience in life. You think a single cell has that? Hmm? And, and you think a, a single, single cell, cell has, that? has a rudimentary form of awareness? Do you think and an atom have, has that? Sorry? Do you think an atom has that? According to Freeman Dyson, yes. Freeman Dyson says an atom has awareness. Yes, sir. Check it out. <laughs> if Freeman Dyson ever said atoms are aware, then he's wrong. I don't think he said it. I think he should sue you. Wow. Depths of understanding that we have yet to fathom, yet to plumb, in order to understand what's going on inside the human brain. Who's we? Who's my mind. we? Who's we? The Let scientific community. The scientific community. Yes. Driven by mechanistic neural networks and chemicals. Yes, and don't let's belittle mechanistic neural networks and chemicals. They well, are very, very Well, then tell me how they produce consciousness. I don't know. That's why we're working on it. <laughs> you don't know either. No, wait. We new atheists are said to be no better than the Muslim extremists who hijack planes and fly them into buildings, or than the fundamentalist Christians who blow up abortion clinics. When was the last time you read of anybody who blew up anything in the name of atheism? Not blew something up and happened to be an atheist, blew something up in the name of atheism. The 19 hijackers of 9-11 did what they did in the name of their religion. They honestly and sincerely believed they were behaving in a good and righteous fashion. They believed they were doing what their God wanted them to do. They believed that they were going to a martyr's reward. 
They believed it because it followed logically from what they had been taught in their faith schools. Atheism doesn't have any faith schools. If we did, by the way, we wouldn't teach them atheism, we'd teach them critical thinking and how to make up their own minds. I can't deny the need for emotional comfort. And I can't claim that the worldview adopted in my book offers any more than moderate comfort. If you're afraid of death, for example, you might superficially think that a priest who tells you that you're not really going to die would be more comforting than a scientist who tells you it is highly implausible that our individuality could survive the decay of our brains. But I have heard... I have heard experienced nurses who've worked all their lives in old people's homes say that the ones who are most terrified of death tend to be the Roman Catholics. <laughs> all that guilt fed from the cradle up and the terror of purgatory and hell. As for eternal nothingness, it's, is it really all that frightening? As Mark Twain said, I do not fear death. I'd been dead for billions and billions of years before I was born and had not suffered the slightest inconvenience. From it. I want to end by reading the opening lines of a previous book of mine, Unweaving the Rainbow. These are lines that I've long earmarked for my own funeral. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of Sahara. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people allowed by our DNA so massively outnumbers the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I, in our ordinariness, that are here. We privileged few who won the lottery of birth against all odds, how dare we whine at our inevitable return to that prior state from which the vast majority have never stirred? Thank you very much. There is no logical pathway leading from atheism to violence. There most certainly are logical pathways leading from religion to violence. Now, of course, not many religious individuals follow those pathways to their logical conclusion, thank goodness. But there is a logical pathway from the Quran, for example, and it only takes a minority to be lured down it. For atheists, there is no such logical pathway. The nearest we get to violence is in the words we use. And there's a big difference. It's a grave misuse of the word extremism to say that atheists are just as extreme as religious extremists. As Victor Stenger, the physicist, has pithily put it in a slogan that might look well on the side of a bus, perhaps. Science flies you to the moon. Religion flies you into buildings. <laughs> <laughs>